This is a video going over all of the exponential function characteristics that we've learned this unit. So I'm going to go through the review sheet and talk about a couple of important things that we should remember when we're looking at exponential functions. First things first, for number one, they're asking about the equation of y equals 2 to the power of x. Well, I know this is an exponential function because I have a variable in the exponent. So I know it's some sort of exponential function. So I went to my calculator and I graphed this already. This is what the graph of 2 to the power of x looks like. And the question asks, what does it intersect? So does it intersect the x-axis only, y-axis only, or some combination of the two? So if I'm looking at this function as I've graphed it, I see that it definitely crosses the y-axis at the point 0, 1. The reason that happens is because if I think about what happens when my x value is 0, if I'm looking for a y value there, remember that anything to the 0 power is 1. So that's why it intersects the y-axis at 1. So it's definitely not choice 1, and it's definitely not choice 4. Now the question is, does it intersect the x-axis? Well, if this function did intersect the x-axis, that means that there would be some value of x that we could plug into 2 to the x to make it equal to 0, so I'd have a y value of 0. Because remember, if I'm touching the x-axis, I have a y value of 0 for some x value. So let's think about that for a minute. 2 to the x. So I see as I'm going into the negative numbers on the left side here, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, if I pick something like 2 to the third, for example, or 2 to the negative third, remember a negative exponent just means that the base is in the wrong place. So I put the base in the denominator, and I make the exponent positive. So 2 to the negative 3 is the same thing as 1 over 2 to the third, which is the same thing as 1 eighth. So a pretty small number, but not quite 0. If I pick something a little bit more drastic, like negative 100 is my x value, so even further to the left on the x-axis, this is the same thing as 1 over 2 to the 100th power. And let's think about this for a minute. 2 to the 100th power is some huge number. So I'm taking 1 and dividing it by some huge number, which is going to give me something very small, so point zero 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 whatever it happens to be, but it's not quite zero. So it's getting closer and closer, but there isn't any exponent that I could plug in here to make this quantity equal zero. So in this case, there is no x-intercept. So I would say this intersects the y-axis only. And the reason that happens is because the domain of this function is from negative infinity to positive infinity, so all of the x values are hit, because I've got this arrow here on the left, which means the graph extends left forever. And this arrow over here, even though it looks like it's going up, it is going a little bit to the right as well. So my domain for this function is from negative infinity to positive infinity. But when I look at the range, it clearly goes up forever on this side. So the max range value would have to be positive infinity but it slopes down and never even touches zero. So I write zero as the beginning of my range here. But remember, for interval notation, this parenthesis means I don't include zero in the interval. So it never actually touches zero on the y-axis. Number two, the graph of the function three to the x power lies in which quadrants? So you could graph this again in your calculator if you wanted to. But notice this is just another exponential growth function that has a y-intercept of 1, because if I raise 3 to the 0 power, I still get 1 as my y-value. And remember, the labeling of the, of the quadrants goes counterclockwise, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So this function right here is contained only in 1 and 2 because it never dips below the x-axis. Number 3. What is the common ratio of the geometric sequence shown? Negative 2, 4, negative 8, 16. All right, so remember that a geometric sequence means that I'm multiplying 
or dividing by the same number every time. And in order to figure out what the common ratio is, it's whatever number that I'm multiplying by to get to each of my next terms. So I notice from negative 2 to 4, if I multiplied by a negative 2 there, I'd get to positive 4. And then if I multiplied positive 4 by negative 2 again, I'd get negative 8. And if I multiply negative 8 by negative 2, I'd get 16. So my common ratio here, my R value, is negative 2. Another way to figure that out if you're not really sure what you're multiplying by is just to take consecutive terms and divide them. The only catch is you need to divide one term by the term directly before it. So in this case I'm taking 4 and dividing it by negative 2 and I get negative 2 there. And you could do that with any pair of terms. So if I pick 16 for example and divide it by negative 8, I'll get that common ratio of negative 2 as well. Number four, given f of x equals 2 to the power of x, which function below represents a horizontal shift of 3 units right and a vertical shift of 5 units down? Remember the formula for figuring out transformations of exponential functions looks a little something like this. f of x equals a times b to the x minus h plus k, where a represents that vertical stretch or shrink, h represents how far left or right it goes, and k represents the vertical shift or how far up and down it goes. So if I go 5 units down, I know it needs to be minus 5 as a k value there. So that rules out answer choice C. And then I need to remember that if I'm moving 3 units to the right, in the function h is going to be equal to 3, so I'm going to see x minus 3 in my function, which leads me to choose choice A because that's a shift to the right. Careful that if you thought it was x plus 3, that's also an answer choice. Always just double check by plugging that into your calculator, going to y equals graphing it, and just make sure that when you compare it to 2 to the x, it moved right 3 and 5 down. So you always have a way to check yourself in your calculator. Number 5. The equation a equals 1300 times 1 1.02 to the 7th power is being used to calculate the amount of money in a savings account. What does the 1.02 represent in this equation? Remember the formula for compound interest is the principal value times 1 plus or minus the rate, depending on if it's growth or decay, raised to the power of t, which is whatever time unit you're working with here. So in this case, my principal value, or what I start with, is 1300, and my time is 7, whatever unit that happens to be in. And the question is, what is my rate based off of this 1.02 in the parentheses? Well, if I try to relate that to the formula, I know this is a growth because it's a savings account. And in a savings account, you make money on your money. That's why we use savings accounts. So it's going to be plus whatever the rate was as a decimal. So let's think about that. What would I have to add to 1 to make it 1.02? That's just 2 hundredths, or 0.02. So I first know that it's a growth because I'm adding something to 1. So I know it can't be choice 1, and I know it can't be choice 2. But remember that when you plug into this equation, it's the decimal form of a percent. So it's not the actual percent, so I wouldn't choose answer choice 2. Remember to convert from a decimal to a percent, you just move the decimal place back two places. So this 0.02 really represents a 2% growth per whatever time interval you're using. Usually it's years. So answer choice 4 is the best fit. Number 6. Some banks charge a fee on a savings account that are left inactive for an extended period of time. The equation y equals 5,000 times 98 hundredths to the x power represents the value y of one account that was left inactive for a period of x years. What is the y-intercept of this equation, and what does it represent? Well, if I give myself a set of axes, 
I could always go to my calculator and graph this, but I want to think about it a little bit first. Remember that 0.98. If your base or your growth factor is less than 1, then the function represents some sort of dk. So I know it's going to start at some value and go down from there. Remember when you start on the y-axis, at this point right here, the x value is 0. So I need to figure out what the corresponding y value is to figure out what the y-intercept is and what it represents. So if I go to my function and I plug in 0 for x, so 0.98 to the 0 power, remember that anything to the 0 power just equals 1. So this is just 1 times 5,000 or... 5,000. So remember that number that you always multiply in the front when we're doing interest problems? That's the principal or the initial value that you start with. So in this account, the, whoever had this account, they must have deposited $5,000 to start off with. So that's the amount of money that's in the account initially, and it also is the y-intercept of the function. Number seven, use the explicit formula a sub n equals a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1 power to determine the ninth term of the geometric sequence 1.5 comma 4.5 comma 13.5 and so on. So I know it's a geometric sequence so I know I'm multiplying by something over and over again. But the problem is here it's not really too obvious what it is so you could play around with it a little bit to see what it is but it's easiest to just take any two terms so I'm going to look at 4.5, and I'm going to divide it by the previous term to figure out what my common ratio is. 4.5 divided by 1.5 is 3. So my common ratio, or my R value, is going to be 3. And you could pick any two points, remember that. So I could have done 13.5 divided by 4.5 and gotten that common ratio of 3 as well. So I need two pieces of information for my explicit formula of a geometric sequence. I need my first term, so my a sub 1 is just 1.5, and my r is 3. So when I plug into the explicit formula, I have 1.5 times 3 to the power of n minus 1. And I'm going to put that 3 in parentheses just so I don't make any mistakes when I'm calculating this. If I want the ninth term of my sequence, that means I'm going to let n be equal to 9. So a sub 9 is equal to 1.5 times 3 to the, if I plug in 9 for n, 9 minus 1 is just 8. And if I plug this into my calculator, 1.5 times 3 to the power of 8, my ninth term is 9,841. Number 8. Anna deposited $1,400 into a savings account. The annual interest rate is 3%, and the interest is compounded annually. Write an equation that can be used to find B, her account balance, after T years. So remember the formula for interest is A equals the principal or the starting amount times 1 plus or minus the rate, depending on if it's increasing or decreasing, to the power of T. Remember that rate needs to be a decimal, though. Notice that they give me the rate as a percent. In order to convert that percent to a decimal, I just move the decimal place two times to the left. So 3% is the same thing as 0 0.03 when I plug that into the equation. So instead of A, they want me to use B here. So B is equal to my principal is what I started with, so that's 1,400 times 1, and I need to think about this if this is growth or decay. If you're earning interest on a savings account, that is a growth function because your money is increasing over time. So that's plus my rate as a decimal is 0 0.03 to the power of t. Just to clean this up a little bit, I can simplify what's in the parentheses. So I'm going to leave my final equation as b equals 1,400 times 1.03 to the power of t, where t is measured in years. So if they want me to find the balance in the count after six years, I would just take the formula I already have and substitute in six for t, because that represents the number of years. 
and when I plug that into my calculator, I get $1,671.67. Remember that it's money, so I always want to round to the hundredth place because that's as far as cents go if you think about making change on a dollar. If I want to think about how much interest she earned, well, it's not going to be this whole $1,671 because she started with $1,400 to begin with. So to figure out how much money she earned as opposed to what she made, what she had in the account at the end of the period, I can take her final balance and subtract from it her initial balance to figure out actually how much interest she made on that money, which is $271.67. Not bad for the account just sitting there. Number nine. Given the parent function f of x equals 4 to the power of x, and the new function g of x equals 1 third times 4 to the x plus 2 minus 1, list the value of each and describe the transformation that results when compared to f of x. So remember that general formula for transformations looks something like this where A represents your vertical stretch or shrink. So in this case, the number I'm multiplying out in front is one-third. And if I multiply something by one-third, remember that it gets smaller. So if I have one-third of my money, it gets smaller. And then if I have one-third of that, it gets even smaller. So this represents a vertical shrink by a factor of one-third. The reason it's a shrink instead of a stretch is because that one-third is less than one. If instead you had some value that was greater than one, let's say your a value is equal to two, that's greater than one, so that would be a vertical stretch instead. So for my k value, it looks like my k value here is negative one, and that shifts the function down one unit because remember that k value at the end is affecting the y value so it's going to move it either up or down and now for the h value that represents the horizontal shift but in my function i see x minus h here i see x plus two if i want to think about what that h value was i would need to convert it to that same form so x minus a negative two would have given me that x plus 2 that I see in my equation there. So it must be that h is negative 2 in order to ensure that when I plug it into this formula over here, I see an x plus 2 by the time I'm done with it. And when I see plus 2 in my formula, I know that's a horizontal shift left 2 units. Had it been the case that I see just x minus 2 there, then that would have been a shift to the right. So just keep that in mind. For the x values, it's kind of the opposite of what you think. When you see a plus sign, it's going to be moving to the left. When you see a minus sign, it's going to be moving to the right. Number 10. The number of carbon atoms in a fossil is given by the function y equals 5,100 times 0.95 to the x, where x represents the number of years since being discovered. Explain what the 5,100 and the 0.95 represent in the equation. Well, if I think about that formula we learned before that we used for interest, this could be used for any sort of exponential function, really. So the number you multiply out in front just represents your initial value. Initial value. So we need to think about what that is in the context of this problem. So they're talking about the number of carbon atoms in a fossil, and T represents the number of years since it was discovered. So in this case, this 1,500 represents the number of carbon atoms that this fossil had when it was discovered. As for the 0.95, I need to think about that as either a growth rate or a decay rate. Well, I know it's less than 1, so I know it's some sort of decaying function. But the question is, if I think about this 1 minus r over here, what would I have to subtract from... 1 to get 0.95. If you're not sure, you could do a little math off to the side and just do 1 minus 0.95 
equals 0 0.05. So I would have had to have subtracted 0 0.05 from the total. So that 0.95 just means that there is a 5% rate of decay per year. So where I get that 5% from is remember that when you plug in that decimal into your equation, that represents a percent. So I would just scoot that decimal place back two places to find that 0 0.05 represents 5%. And since I'm subtracting it to get to that 0.95 that I see in my parentheses there, I know that it is a rate of decay as opposed to a rate of growth.